we've been talking um, today about a crisis in retention of uh, women throughout the profession, and Nemini is the antidote to that crisis. Um, there is perhaps nobody who has uh, had more staying power than her. She is a woman of true grit, and she is a woman of, uh, the, in an overused word, true inspiration. I think, um, like me, you will stand taller and breathe more deeply after you've listened to her. We have so much to talk about, and they've given us a measly 20 minutes, so I'm going to speed things through and move through Nemini's life. She's 85 now, um, in, in chunks, and have to press the fast-forward button. Um, Nemini was born in 1932, and we're going to pick things up when she went to Somerville College, Oxford, to read law. Nemini, tell us, was this a good preparation for life at the bar? In no way. It was enormous fun, but we spent the whole of the first year doing Roman law, mostly in Latin, so we added, I could tell you how to manumit a slave, but I couldn't tell you how to defend a shoplifter. Um, second year? A se second year. <laughs> The second year was spent doing medieval land law, mostly in Norman French. <laughs> so the first two years were strange. Um, and of course, one occupied oneself with extramural activities. <laughs> I was very fortunate in my room uh, was adjacent to the Rad Radcliffe Infirmary. And although we had to be in, in the college by seven o'clock, I could get straight out into the Radcliffe over the roof and go and enjoy myself in the town. It was a splendid preparation for life in general. Um, there you go, funny and scandal already. And Nemini, how many of you were there um, at college reading law? Two. A girl called Audrey Briscoe and myself. We didn't, there wasn't a resident law tutor. So we were farmed out to Keeble College, where there was a tutor called Davidge, who was known, nobody knew his Christian name, but he was known as Davidge's father because his son rode for the university. Um, so we went to Davidge's father, who treated us with total contempt. Um, he said, neither of you are clever. Um, the idea of you going to the bar is absolutely laughable. Um, but it doesn't matter, as both of you will commit matrimony. <laughs> Good news when they got a part-time tutor. Tell us about her. The part-time tutor was Hazel Fox, who was um, Lord Denning's stepdaughter. And she, I think she was in Fountain Court. She certainly, she... Um, had, she got chambers, unlike, unlike most women at that time. But it's said that she was given her tenancy because everybody wanted to know what the old man was up to. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your life at university. Um, you then uh, found a pupillage, and I want you to tell us how you were able to do that, given that so many women at the time were able to gain a qualification, but then weren't able to use it because they just couldn't get a foot in the door. I'm afraid it was nepotism. Um, my father at the time was, um, he was a professional soldier, and he was chief of intelligence um, for the Rhine Army in Germany. And he was um, investigating war crimes and feeding the information he gained to the Nuremberg team of prosecutors. So he became very friendly with um, David Maxwell Five, later Lord Kilmuir, and he asked him to fix me up. <laughs> so it wasn't on merit, I'm afraid, it was purely nepotism. And so I was um, given a pupillage with. Uh, a man called Mervyn Griffith Jones, who was one of the um, team prosecuting at Nuremberg, and he was at the time Treasury Counsel, um, practicing mainly at the Old Bailey. So I spent my first six months with him. He didn't at all like taking a woman, although he was very nice to me, but I could see him bristling with embarrassment <laughs> when I appeared with him in court or in the bar mess at the Old Bailey. And um, 
His clerk, who was a very redoubtable fellow called Henry Twelftree, I remember him saying to Mervyn, um, Sir, this is a royal command, but it need never be repeated. And on the day I arrived in Chambers, the junior clerk was given the job of going to Boots in Fleet Street, getting some nail varnish remover, and removing my nail varnish. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and you had um, some other sartorial incidents with Mervyn, I think. Oh yes, in those days all the chaps wore bowler hats and all the girls wore kid gloves and I had some splendid pale pink kid gloves and I went down to the bailiff with Mervyn one day and he just, he looked at my hands and he just said, pink gloves Nemi at the old bailiff. <laughs> You then um, did a second pupillage for your second six months, and what can you tell us about that? I did that pupillage in Pump Court, uh, Western Circuit Chambers. Ewan Montagu was the head of chambers, and Rose Halbron was also a tenant there. She, I must say, was inspirational. She was my heroine. She was, I think, one of the first two Queen's Council uh, women keep Queen's Council, very unpretentious, very kind, lovely woman, and very nice to um, junior uh, people like myself, very kind. Norman Broderick was um, practiced in medical negligence and family law, did a lot of um, the old awful defended divorce cases, which were a total nightmare. And having been instructed in one case where there were six children of the family and three gave evidence for the father and three gave evidence to mother, I thought this is such a nightmare. I'm never going to touch family law again, and I never did. It seemed to me the defended divorce was a, a horrible thing. And thank God the law was changed and it no longer exists. Um, at the Sparks Conference, we don't like to lower the tone, but what happened in your second pupillage um, when you wanted to spend a penny? Oh, no, this was when I got, finally got a tenancy. Um, I got a tenancy in chambers in um, Hare Court. Uh, the head of chambers was a man called Jack Elson Rees. Later, uh, Ian Purcell, who was um, uh, Solicitor General. But the, when they took me on, I was the first woman who had been taken on. And on the first morning, they put a, a Yale lot on the lock on the lavatory. And they gave a key to each of the chaps in chambers, but told me that I'd have to go up Fleet Street to the, and use the cardoma. <laughs> <laughs> what was the cardoma? The cardoma was cafe in Fleet Street. But I was barred from the facilities that existed at her, at her, her court. And uh, so that's one hurdle that you had to overcome. Um, shame they didn't have Fitbits in the 1950s. But um, what happened about work? Um, I wasn't allowed any. I was told the, um, <laughs> the chambers uh, depended largely on the this was in the days before the CPS. Um, it depended largely on work provided by the, the Scotland Yard solicitor. And I was told the Yard solicitor didn't like women, so I couldn't have any work from the Yard solicitor. And I didn't. Even um, think, humble things like traffic cases, I was not allowed to do. So I had to go out and do my own canvassing. <laughs> When I spoke to Nemini in preparation for this, I, she, I said to her, well, what did you do? And she said, um, well, I just went out and got my own work. <laughs> and I said, yes, but what did you do? So what do you do if you're a woman of enterprise? How did you go about it? Well, there's a wonderful system called the dot brief. You went to court and you sat in a row with other unemployed counsel and the chap in the dock came in and said, I love him or I love her. <laughs> and that's, um, so that was one way. The other way was going on circuit. I was on the Western Circuit and one went down um, 
to say Winchester, Exeter, all the way down to Penzance. And one stayed at the bar hotel and one had dinner with the rest of the bar in a part of the dining room that was curtained off from the general public. And the wine waiter had certain privilege, uh, patronage, <coughs> and he would um, come round at dinner and lean over uh, the back of one's chair and say, um, Miss Lethbridge, would you take the case of that? <laughs> <laughs> and he had this, uh, this pool of, um, of prosecution work. So he, was, he was a very valuable source. <laughs> I really do think we're missing a trick class. It's so overrated, you know. Bring back the wine waiter. <laughs> so you got dot briefs, you went out on circuit, but there came a time when you got a bit of a break. Now, how did that happen? I got a break because I um, was instructed by a firm where the senior partner who did all his own advocacy in the week was Orthodox Jew and he couldn't go to court on Saturday. So he used to send me to court um, on his behalf. And so I did get some work from this firm. He had a lot of work in the East End, which was useful. And that was how, we're not going to talk about them too much because um, we're here to talk about the women doing the work, but you had some particular clients that you came across that way and just touch on them briefly. Oh, they were called the Cray Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to get arrested every Friday evening <laughs> by a very um, vigorous young PC in, in uh, the East End. <laughs> And so every Saturday morning they would appear in Arbor Square Magistrates Court. And there I would be, um, making myself busy. And I thought I was, uh, you know, really the cat's whiskers because I got wonderful results for them. I didn't think it had anything to do with the large men standing in the back of the court <laughs> looking rather menacing. So it was a good way to build up a practice. <laughs> I've got this scrapbook and there's a newspaper cutting of you at the age of 24 in the Criminal Court of Appeal. Can you tell us anything about that? Well, I didn't remember the case until you showed me the cutting. There, 24, you're yes. in the Court of Appeal, you know, just, just not terribly memorable, really. <laughs> I now remember it was a firearms case, again, from the East End, so I guess it must have been the Cray connection because they did recommend me to their mates. <laughs> <laughs> I hasten to add that I didn't get them there 30 years. <laughs> that was somebody else. <laughs> um, I want to move forward uh, a little bit. There came a time when you had to leave the bar and we're not going to talk about that too much, but it came about as a result of the man you fell in love with and chose to marry, who um, was a chap of uh, some notoriety as a result of being a, a, a convicted murderer. And um, that was fine with your chambers, as I understand it, while the matter was secret. But then there came a time when it became public. And what happened then with your chambers as a result? Um, well, I, when it became public, I was very um, embarrassed and I was particularly upset on behalf of my mother. So I took her off to Greece to escape the press and she and I went to Greece and um, for six weeks. This was the time of the Bay of Pigs, I'll never forget it. So we came back and looked at the newspapers and realized the world had nearly come to an end during our absence, and we'd known nothing about it. But anyway, when I got back to London, my name had been removed from the door of Chambers. And the head of Chambers at that time was the Solicitor General. And he, sa he wrote me a short letter saying, uh, we don't have to go into the reasons for this, but you'll understand that um, you're no longer a suitable member of Chambers. And so, um, I had to leave, and it took me 18 years to get back to the bar. 
And in that time, I think you tried various ways um, through and around, and you did think about cross-qualifying as a solicitor. What happened in that respect? I did. I got myself disbarred um, in order to become a solicitor. But when I got the trust accounts book, I thought, oh, dear me. <laughs> I can never do this. I've always been a bit enumerate. Um, so I thought I'd go on trying to get back to, to um, the bar, back to Chambers. And actually, I went to see the then um, Lord Chancellor. This was during, uh, I think, the Callaghan administration. The Lord Chancellor at that time was Gerald Gardner. And he said, I, I really do sympathize with you. Um, what you've done is a noble thing. I'd love to help you, but unfortunately, we don't take women in these chambers. So that was a no-no. But then in the end, um, in 1981, I was actually offered a place in chambers by an eccentric old gentleman called Louis de Pinner. Um, who was very advanced in his thinking, in that he uh, had taken on a number of um, black tenants. He was extremely um, liberal in his... He was actually a leading member of the Liberal Party. Um, very liberal in his attitude, and my disgraceful history didn't upset him. And he offered me a place, and I, I became a tenant in his chambers, which were at 36B Chancery Lane. And as they say, the rest is history. And later I became, I was in chambers with my lovely clerk, Paul Harding, who was sitting right there, who now clerks Katie. <laughs> and he did me proud. <laughs> Not as proud as you did me. <laughs> there you go, there's a man who's listening and speaking up for a woman. <laughs> um, Nemini, uh, We've talked um, about your career and um, you've given us an idea that uh, you can't do land law, you're useless at trusts, you're hopeless with figures. For you, it's all about the advocacy and it's all about injustice. Yes. Um, there came a time, about 20 or so years ago, when the government decided to abolish legal aid for personal injury. Did, do you think that that was a little bit not terribly okay? I was outraged. I thought it was the most monstrous thing. I can tell you exactly when it was. It was 1995, 1st of April, and a member of my chambers called Mark Toomey, well known to Paul, who is now in Silk, practices in the family division, he and I decided to set up a law centre, which we did, unfunded, um, in Stokington, <coughs> and it's going great guns still, 20, 25 years, no, nearly 25 years later. And what do you do at the Law Centre? We do pretty well everything except employment. We don't, because employment requires an office which is open seven days a week, really, because there's such a strict timetable in employment law. Um, we do pretty well everything else. A um, lot of refugee cases. I mean, that now we're flooded with refugees, of course. And legal aid has been withdrawn largely for immigration matters. And so they're in desperate circumstances. Um, happily, we have a member who is on the Home Office approved list. You can't practice in immigration law unless you're on the Home Office approved list. But we have somebody who can cover <coughs> that. And so we do a lot of uh, immigration. But we also do, um, well, you know, grist to the mill, housing, um, council tax, uh, domestic violence, pretty well. And the Law Centre is open every Saturday, is that yes, right? Yes, And you're still to be found there every yes, Saturday? Yes, every Saturday afternoons. <laughs> With our other volunteers. All volunteers. We don't touch money at all. Nemini, um, it's been amazing talking to you. We've got a one-minute warning. I'm going to ask you, I hope you've had time to think about this, if you've got a top advocacy tip for us. <laughs> This is very difficult, but I think 
put yourself in the shoes of the client. Try and imagine what it's like to be them. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you.